My name is Sarah Homewood and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen. I'm going to present Self-Tracking to Do Less, an autoethnography of long COVID that informs the design of pacing technologies. As we all know, wearable fitness tracking technologies are typically employed to increase physical activity uh, in order to improve health. However, rather than using these devices to do more and get fitter, today I'm going to discuss how I misused self-tracking tools to do less during post-COVID syndrome. I first became ill with COVID-19 at the end of October 2020, and my main symptoms have been heart, blood pressure and breathing disorders and mental and physical fatigue, and as well as cognitive problems. I did not use any type of tracking device before I became ill. Uh, I bought a Fitbit four months after the initial infection of COVID-19 because I suspected that I had an autonomic nervous system disorder and this was triggering an increase in my heart rate when I stood up. And it was this that was leading to uh, symptoms of fainting and dizziness. And since I could not see a doctor uh, because of the pandemic to be properly assessed for, an, for this autonomic nervous system disorder, I purchased a Fitbit to track my heart rate and find out. And I'm now going to present summaries of my three autoethnographic vignettes from my paper about how I used my Fitbit to do less during long COVID. So from when I purchased my Fitbit until about six months later, when these symptoms mostly faded away, every time I went from sitting or lying down to standing up, I would pause, staring at my Fitbit device interface on my wrist. The initial value would be around 60 beats per minute. And after one minute, the numbers would start to slowly increase and become faster and faster. And as I watched these numbers rise, I felt a hot rush of blood to my head um, that would result in faintness and a headache. The final value could be anywhere from 90 to 140 beats per, min per minute, uh, as you can see in these screenshots of my cardio heart tracking app. After a few minutes of standing, the numbers would slowly start to cascade down to a more normal 70 or 80 beats per minute. The value at the peak of this spike in heart rate shaped how I viewed the severity of my long COVID uh, illness that day. The higher the value, the sicker I would see myself, uh, even though this wasn't based on validated medical information. If I got out of bed and the peak of my heart rate spike was 140 beats per minute, I felt like it would... I would have a bad day and I'd probably just stay in bed rather than taking a walk. Around three months after buying my Fitbit, I joined my friends on a weekend trip to the seaside and this is Wales in June um, and I managed to participate in a few of the activities and spent the rest of the time in bed in the hotel. But despite this, I pushed myself to do more than I had done before. On the second day of my holiday, uh, we were walking through the local village when my wrist started to vibrate. And it took me a while to work out that the sensation was coming from my Fitbit since the first time, this was the first time this, is ha this had happened. I looked at my Fitbit and I saw there was a pixelated animation of fireworks and birds flying, lighting up the screen. I was very confused. One of the birds in the animation was pulling a banner and I saw it said 10,000 steps I immediately felt a powerful flush of horror and started crying. Had I really walked 10,000 steps? How could I have done this without noticing? It was not that I was feeling tired and could feel it in my body that I'd walked too much, but rather it was seeing the numbers that cause a spiral of anxiety. The joyful animations that made, uh, make this data even harder to accept. Being given bad news in the format of good news highlighted how far I was away from a normal, healthy user of a Fitbit device. Since I had post-exertion malaise, where my uh, symptoms worsened after physical and mental exertion, I would typically ignore Fis Fitbit's suggestion to do more and actually congratulate myself when I stuck to under 5,000 steps. Since I'd learned that walking more than this would lead to my symptoms getting worse over the next few days, and as well as limiting my steps, I also began using my Fitbit to set my walking pace to make sure my heart rate didn't go over 110 beats per minute for too long. After having long COVID for 15 months, my symptoms began to improve. 
After a final test at the long COVID clinic at the hospital, I was told by my doctor that I needed to actually start increasing physical activity to avoid other health, pro health problems. This felt like a very thin tightrope to walk between not worsening my symptoms by doing too much and not allowing other health problems to surface because of inaction. In this final phase of long COVID, the desire to maintain my recovery also transferred into my choice of stationary resting activities. On my cardiogram app, if my heart rate is under 60 beats per minute, the graph turns blue, as you can see here uh, in, this, in the screenshots. This color is not given meaning in the, di in the cardiogram app. And in this later phase of long COVID, my stationary heart rate was actually lower than it was during the rest of my illness. And I could get more of these blue zones during the day, as you can see uh, on the left. This led to me playing a game of chasing these blue zones with the belief that they were a good sign, since if my heart rate was low, then I was in a state of relaxation where my body could heal. These screenshots show how my heart rate can vary when I'm resting, as you can see in the white bars on the bottom here, which signify uh, inaction. On a good day, I'm in the blue zone and a bad day still in the orange when resting. None of these beliefs are founded in information given to me by my doctor. And though they are accurate in terms of general pacing guidelines and my own experience that exertion and a high heart rate causes relapse, this is a very simplistic and not totally logical way of defining a health goal for myself. For example, I had blue phases when scrolling on social media for hours, but knitting gave me a, high, a heart rate over 60. This doesn't mean that social media is more healing than knitting. I now want to discuss some aspects that my autoethnography reveal in terms of how technologies could specifically uh, designed to help people with chronic illnesses pace their energy. Pacing is a self-management technique for chronic illnesses that supports people in balancing energy and rest through dividing day-to-day -day activities into chunks. Decisions can then be made about which activities are appropriate in the context of the individual's energy levels. Although pacing technologies would probably have many similarities with fitness uh, tracking technologies in that they would use sensors attached to the body to collect data and a visual interface for self-reporting data and accessing information, my experience of having or using a Fitbit whilst having long COVID points to a new design opening for technologies that provide novel experiences of being ill. One theme evident in my uh, autoethnography is how the knowledge produced by my body was seen as less valuable than data produced by my Fitbit. This is in spite of the fact that a uh, Fitbit is not a medical device and is often known to be inaccurate. As described in my first vignette, I would use the numerical value to determine whether I was going to have a good day or a bad day. So I propose that pacing technologies could be designed to include the bodily experience of the user in the tracking process alongside qualitative data. Since I might have got, gone on to have a bad day from a quantitative perspective, but a good day from a qualitative perspective. Another theme was how pacing technologies could support users in decision making to balance both mental and physical well-being. Once we reject a normative definition of illness as something to be recovered from rather than something to live with, <clears throat> I propose that an alternative, more reflective and collaborative approach can, can also be reflected in the design of these devices that engages the user in a reflective conversations about decisions about their quality of life. And many chronic illnesses, including long COVID, are dynamic disabilities that are episodic. The ill body is in a constant state of flux. And this, this produces particular ways, uh, ways of being that shape our interactions with technologies. And I believe that designing technology for a body in a state of flux might produce more useful and appropriate technologies for chronic illness, rather than designing with a fixed textbook definition of illness. This might also lead to um, reflecting a more positive rather than negative uh, perspective on illness through tracking technologies. And I propose that studying how illnesses shape experiences with interactions with technologies uh, is an important and underexplored area of HCI. Thank you.